welcome. Glad to have everyone here. Um, today we are closing out the last chapter of 2 Samuel um, and continuing David's story. Um, as you learned last week, it was the title of the chapter was David's Last Words, but we know that those weren't his last words. Um, David's death is not actually recorded until the book of 1 Kings, chapter 2, verse 10, is when David dies. Um, so here we have um, another misstep, if you will, in David's life. And you would think by now he would have everything figured out. But we're in 2 Samuel chapter 24. So if you have your Bibles, turn with, with me there or use your phone. Uh, but first, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your house to worship. Lord, to study your word. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you as we celebrate this weekend. We celebrate the Independence Day of America. Lord, we thank you for all of the men and women who have paid the ultimate price to guarantee our freedom, Lord, and our independence. Lord, we thank you, and Lord, we honor you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so 2 Samuel chapter 24. Um, we're doing all verses, 25 verses. Um, so the very first verse throws us a huge curveball. So there's a lot we can dig out of this first verse. Um, it begins by telling us, it says, Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. But we got to be careful how we read that. Because if you just read through that really quickly, doesn't it sound like God is the one who told David to do the census? Let's read it again. It says, Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them. Go taking it a census so it sounds like god is saying here david go and take his census but if you look at how this is written um it says he and if it had been god it would have said the lord god or the lord told david and it says he so we can do some further homework if we turn over to first chronicles and it gives us a little more in-depth behind the scenes look at what was taking place um, in first chronicles uh, chapter 21 verse 1 it tells us satan rose up against israel and incited david to take a census of israel so look who they he is um, and you'll notice in your bible i don't i'm not sure if your bible is going to match up with mine but when it mentions he told David, it's lowercase he. Um, and we know that any time it's ever referring to Jesus or to God himself, it's capitalized. Um, and so the he in this first verse is Satan. Um, Satan is the one who incited David to take this census. And, you know, and another that it was Satan and not God that was doing this is one popular misconception is that God can get us to do these things, to do wrong things. Well, God led me to do that. And, or God caused me to do this or tempted me. Well, let's go to the Bible. Let's look and see what it says. In the book of James, chapter 1, Verses 13 through 15, it says, When you are tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So did God tempt David? No. Satan did. Satan is the one who enticed him to plant this seed in his mind 
to get him to take this census. So, but we have to ask ourselves, what was so wrong with David taking a census? What was bad about taking a census? Mm -hmm. Right. It was more of a pride thing because David, you know, David did have a glorious life. You look back on his history and all the military conquests he had and everything that God helped him accomplish. But he was forgetting here and he was leaving out the most important person, God. Because without God, he wouldn't have been able to do any of those things. So it was more of a prideful thing, but it was also a commandment handed down by God in the book of Exodus to Moses um, about there were specific requirements when a census was taken, um, and he didn't follow that to the letter. Um, in Exodus chapter 30, um, verses 11 and 12, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, When you take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life at the time he is counted. Then no plague will come on them when you number them. So when you take a census, there had to be a fee paid for each person that was counted. And David didn't do that. And he says, if you follow these steps, then... No plague will come among the people. And the fee that was taken was not just some random arbitrary fee um, or like we see on some of our bills, other fees or other charges, surcharge, you know. This, this um, ransom that was paid, it was to go to the temple treasury. Um, it wasn't just some random thing and Moses was lying in his pockets to take a census. It was specifically laid out in detail that it was to go into the temple treasury and to be used for a specific purpose. Um, but that was the procedure that God wanted carried out when a census was taken. So back to verse 1 of chapter 24. It says, we have David saying, go and take a census of Israel and Judah. But who did we learn is behind that? Satan. Satan is the one who put that seed in his head. So it tells us in verse 2, So the king said to Joab and the army commanders with him, Go throughout the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. And remember, it wasn't common practice back then to have a fully staffed, serving military on hand at all times. They were only called up when needed. They had commanders and over different regions, but the soldiers weren't soldiers full time. They went back home to their community, to their home, to farm, to whatever they did, raise livestock, and they carried on with their lives. And they didn't serve full time in the military 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, so David wanted them to go throughout all the land. And when he said from Dan to Beersheba, if you were to look at a map, if you have a map in your Bible or on your phone, um, you can look. And Dan is all the way up by Mount Hermon in the northernmost part of Israel. Beersheba is south of Jerusalem, all the way down at the southern end of the kingdom. So he's saying, look, from top to bottom, I want you guys to go throughout the entire nation, and I want you to count all of the fighting men. And why did he specify fighting men? Because he didn't want to count the old folks, right? Could they fight? Not for long. <laughs> they didn't have the stamina or the strength or the endurance to do so. So he said only count the fighting men. Um, he says, I want to know how many there are. But Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over, and may the eyes of my Lord the king see it. But why does my Lord the king want to do such a thing? And right here, even though we've learned that Joab has his faults too, 
Joab is remembering, if you will, what he said to Moses in Exodus. Um, and remember, at this point, the only scripture that was available was the first five books. And so they would have studied this, and they would have known the law and the decrees, and Joab apparently, when David asked for this, all of a sudden a light went off in Joab's head, and he remembered Exodus um, chapter 30, verses 11 and 12, and he remembered that there was a requirement to be taken and that we should do this cautiously. And he says, but why, if you don't mind me asking, David, why do you want to do this? You know, he was trying to cause uh, David to question himself and to maybe think twice before doing it. He says, the king's word, however, overruled Joab and the army commanders, so they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. So Joab began to, like, slightly protest and say, you know, David, why do you really want to do this? Why, why do you really want to do this? And David was like, nope. I've already said it. You guys head on out. And so David's uh, command there overruled them, and they went out. It says in verse 5, um, after crossing the Jordan, um, they camped near Aor, south of the town in the gorge, and then went through Gad and on to Jazer. They went to Gilead and the region of Tatim Hadshi, and on to Dan, Jan, and around towards Sidon. They went toward the fortress of Tyre and all the towns of the Hivites and the Canaanites. Finally, they went on to Beersheba in the Negev of Judah. So basically, he just listed all the geographical points on their journey, and they, they kind of went up the coastline, Sire and Tide, um, Tyre and Sidon were along the coast. They were coastal cities. And so they kind of went up the coastline. They made a loop up at Dan. Then they circled back and came right on back down to Beersheba. Um, so they made their entire journey throughout the land. Uh, verse 8, it says, After they had gone through the entire land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. So this was no one-day task. And remember, they didn't have cars, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have a train to travel on, they had to do it by foot, by horseback, however they got there, and it took them nine months and 20 days. Um, so it took them a very long time to do this. Um, it says, Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king. In Israel... There were 800,000 able-bodied men who could handle a sword. And in Judah, 500,000. So in the northern part of the kingdom, there were 800,000. In the southern part of the kingdom, sorry, uh, there were 500,000. So total, we've got 1,300,000 able-bodied men who could fight in the war and who could handle a sword. Um, they even went so far as to find out if they could even knew how to use a sword. Um, and I can't help but think of Peter uh, when he cut off the man's ear in the garden. Now, could Peter handle a sword? Not really, because I don't think he was aiming for the guy's ear. He was probably aiming for his neck, and instead he got an ear. So, yeah, Peter used a sword. He just wasn't very good at it. Um, so these men that they counted were able-bodied men, fighting men. Um, they were young. They knew how to handle themselves. They knew how to use a sword. Um, but 1,300,000, and that's a sizable army, um, especially in that day when many of the other nations, when they would fight in battles, they very rarely numbered over 200,000 men. And here David is now seeing his total number of men available to him is 1,300,000. And in that day, that was unheard of. He could have gone up against any nation and just wiped them out. 
uh, with that number of men. Um, he says, interesting thing happens though. Joab reports back, gives him this report, shows him the list of all the men, gives him the total number. In verse 10, all of a sudden David starts to feel bad about this. He's starting to worry. It says David was conscious stricken. He was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men, and then he said to the Lord, I have sinned. It dawned on him at that point that I shouldn't have done this, but the deed has been done. He says, he says I've sinned, Lord, greatly in what I have done. He says, now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. So... In his haste to find out how many men there were and to feel good about himself, he did it, but now he's realizing, I think I overstepped my bounds here. Um, yes, I am the king. Yes, I'm the ruler of this nation, but there's somebody else in charge, and it's God. And I overstep, overstepped in my place here. He says, verse 11, before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad, the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I am giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. Um, so Gad went to David and said to him, Shall there come on you three years of famine in your land? or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you, or three days of plague in your land. Now then, think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. And who's the one who sent him? God. So imagine, if you will, what came to my mind is the old TV game show where you had to pick what was behind door number one, door number two, or door number three. And that's what David's been given here, except David knows what's behind those doors. So he's got a choice to make. What would we pick? That's a hard one, isn't it? Three years of famine. Three years of famine, that could have detrimental effects, couldn't it? How much do you think the population would decrease after three years of famine? A lot. Um, what would that do to the number of fighting men? Probably in half. Um, but he's given not just that choice. He says, or three months of you having to run with your tail tucked between your legs from your enemies while they're pursuing you for three months. Or three days of plague in your land. So what's the shortest route? Three days. Get it done and over with, right? Let's not drag this thing out. Um, but let's see how he decides here. David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. He says, let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but do not let me fall into human hands. See, he didn't want to have to run from his enemies, because if he did, that's fallen into human hands, right? He didn't want that. Um, it says, so then the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated, which was three days. And 70,000 of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. And isn't it interesting that God records the same geographical area that David had commanded to be counted in the census? So 70,000 men from Dan to Beersheba died in this plague in only three days. Um, and it says, when the, angel of the, when the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, enough. He says, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. 
When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. The shepherd, he says, I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. So David had witnessed this death happen in three days. And he was also given the ability to see the angel at work. And with his hand outstretched over Jerusalem, ready to just wipe it off the map. And God tells the angel, that's enough. Stop right there. He says, I think David gets the point. And so here, David is also able to see the angel standing there at the threshing floor of this man's house um, and his property. But again, we're going to go over to First Chronicles because it gives us a little more detail into what's taking place here with this angel. Um, First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 16 gives us more detail into what David witnessed when he saw the angel. It says, David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth. So where is that? That's up, isn't it? This angel is standing between heaven and earth. And I would always, I always, from what I've read and what I can gather, angels are not my size. Angels are pretty big. And here's this guy standing between heaven and earth. And he says he's not only standing there, but with a drawn sword. So here's this mighty angel standing there with his sword drawn, ready. And he probably got caught in mid-swing when God told him to stop, when he was going to destroy Jerusalem. And here he is standing here with his, as he has a drawn sword in his hand extended over the city of Jerusalem. And David witnesses this. It says, then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell face down. And because they were realized how pitiful they are in the sight of this angel and of God. And what he could have done and could have destroyed the city in a moment. Um, so back to our text. Uh, God had told the angel, withdraw your hand. It says he's at the threshing floor. Um, when David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, he says, I've sinned. He said, but these people have done nothing wrong. He says, they're just sheep. He said, I was their shepherd. He said, I'm the one who led them into destruction. He said, punish me. Don't punish the people anymore. He said, may your judgment fall on me and my family. Um, so moving on in verse 18, he says, On that day Gad went to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded him through Gad, when Aruna looked and saw the king and his officials coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Aruna said, Why is my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Aruna said to David, Let my lord the king take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and here are the threshing sledges and the oak, ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty Aruna gives all of this to the king. Aruna also said to him, May the Lord your God accept you. Now, that seems like a natural response, right? The king has come to you with a decree from God that you're to build an altar on this threshing floor, and the king says, I'd like to buy it from you, and the guy's like, Hey, just... You guys take it. It's yours. I'll do whatever, you know, it's, I'll give it to you. But David has an interesting reply. But the king replied to Aruna, No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. 
Now, David could have easily taken that stuff from the guy, and he could have said, yep, thank you. Um, you're a loyal servant. You're a loyal subject. Thank you for giving all this to me, and now I'm going to offer this to the Lord. But would the Lord have appreciated that? No, because David wouldn't have had to lift a finger to do it, right? And you have to also remember back to the time of Abraham. Remember when Abraham was given or they were going to give him land to bury his wife in? And Abraham refused to take that land for free. He said, he said no, I'm going to pay you for the full price for it. What's the asking price? I'm going to pay you the full price. And over and over, Abraham did that throughout his life because his take on it was, I don't want you to have anything over me either. He says, I want you to know that I'm an honest businessman. I want to pay the full price for it so that years later you can't say, oh, I gave this to Abraham, and now I can hold this over his head. Um, Abraham wanted to pay the full price for it. So David is like Abraham here. He wants to pay the price for it because he doesn't want to offer something to God that didn't cost him anything. How, how special is that? Um, you know. So he does insist on paying for it. So it tells us that David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayer in behalf of the land, and the plague of Israel was stopped. But you'll notice that the plague was still ongoing all the while this was happening, while this transaction was taking place. Even though God had told the angel to hold your hand, to stay your hand, he's standing there with his sword drawn, but the plague is still ongoing. And the plague doesn't stop until the offerings have been made, until the sacrifices have been made. It didn't stop until that time. It says he, his prayer was answered, but not until the offerings had been made. Um, so back to First Chronicles again to share with, with you some more insight uh, to what was going on behind the scenes. Um, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 26 through 27. It tells us about David building the altar, but it also gives us more insight into the angel that was there. It says, David built an altar to the Lord there, and he sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He called on the Lord, and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offerings. Does that sound familiar to anyone el anywhere else in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Who else called down fire from heaven? Elijah. Elijah. So this wasn't just a normal offering where they would set the offering on the altar and then set it on fire with kindling underneath of it. This was lit from the top. He called on God and God answered with fire coming down from heaven to burn up that offering on the altar. Um, so this was not a normal fire. It says that he set fire from heaven on the altar of the burnt offering. Then the Lord spoke to the angel, and he put his sword back into his sheath. So not only did the plague stop when the offering was complete, the angel did not put that sword back in its sheath until the offering was complete. And David was able to witness that. Um, and so it's just amazing that he was able to give that. He, God gave him that ability to see behind the scenes and to see what was going on and that angel. And how many angels did he send to do that? Just one. Just one guy. It could have been just Angel Steve um, waiting for his turn in the back. And he volunteered, Lord, I'll do it. <laughs> and he, he sent him to do it. And how many people were killed? 70,000. And he was about to strike the city of Jerusalem, one angel with one sword, to destroy it. And 
Is God powerful? Yes. <laughs> Do we need to be reminded sometimes that God is powerful? He he's, holds a lot more power than we give him credit for on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Uh, we forget, just like David did, that there's somebody else in charge. And I heard something interesting this week, and it kind of made me think. Um, because we like to be in charge, right? We like to feel like we're in control. Um, you know, I, I always think of driving. I like to drive. And Laura can tell you this. How many times does she get to drive when we're in the car together? Hardly ever. Because I like to drive. Why do I like to drive? I like to feel like I'm in control. And I like to think that if something were to happen, I can control that situation and keep them safe and react in time and keep them safe. And we do that in a lot of different aspects of our life, don't we? We like to try and hold on to this. We got this over here. We think we got this under control, but we also have to hold on to this. We want to keep this under control too. Uh, we've got to keep control of our budget. We got to keep control of this. We got to keep control of that. And all, sometimes we get overwhelmed, don't we? And we forget that he's the one that's ultimately in control. And sometimes that's a hard thing to do. But once you realize that he really does have everything under control, it's almost a relief. Because we don't have to carry all that stuff that's weighing us down and feel like we have to control it day in and day out all the different things that's going on in the world. Nobody likes to watch the news. All of these things are going wrong. It seems like everything's going to pot. But we got to remember, he's in control. And we don't have to worry. He's got it. And that's a relief. You mean I don't have to control it? <laughs> he's the one that's controlling it. Thank goodness. Because it would be a bigger mess if we were in control, wouldn't it? Um, he's the one that's got it under control. So this week we did close out um, 2 Samuel. Uh, next week we're going to be going into uh, the book of 1 Kings. As I mentioned, David is still kicking. He's still alive and kicking. Um, he does not um, die until uh, midway through chapter 2 in 1 Kings. And then we lead right into Solomon. And Solomon is proclaimed king uh, before David passes away. David gives him the throne. Uh, but there's a lot of turmoil that takes place. It's not an easy transition um, of power that happens in that transition. Yes, Tim. Um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, mm -hmm. I put notes in my Bible too mm -hmm. that corrections were there mm -hmm. where Solomon lived to build the temple. Awesome. That's neat. A lot of geographical significance, isn't it? Um, so, um, but we do have that coming up. So if you have time uh, this week, read through chapter 1 of 1 Kings. It is a very lengthy chapter, um, but it's uh, 53 verses, but it shouldn't take you long. Um, it's where we see David proclaiming that Solomon is king, but... Uh, there's some interesting kind of family uh, trouble that happens in the process, and that's no surprise because what did God say would happen to David's family? There would be strife between all the family members for the rest of their days, and there would be a sword in his own household. So there's all this infighting in the family. So the transition of power is not a peaceful one, um, but we'll see how that plays out. So let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your enduring word. Lord, we thank you for the example of David's life that you've given us. Lord, help us to learn from his life, to learn from the mistakes that he made, to learn from the lessons that he was taught by you. Lord, help us to apply those to our lives. Lord, help us to realize that we don't have to be in control of everything. We don't have to have all the answers. We just have to realize that you're the one that's in control and that we can give that control to you. 
And Lord, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.